Anyway, we're still in our sermon series on the uh, book of Mark. We've been in it for 33 weeks now. And we're actually going to be talking about one of my favorite topics today. It's worship. Not just worship, but real, genuine worship. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. But I want you to notice something about this text. I call it a sandwich story. Because on the outside of the sandwich, we have the bread. We've got verses 1 and 2, and then... At the other end, the other side of the sandwich, we have verses 10 and 11. But I'll say that bread is not white bread, that bread is not wheat bread, that bread is the bread of hatred. The first two scriptures, verses 1 and 2, are the hatred of the religious leaders and the priests toward Jesus. Versus the second side of that sandwich, verses 10 and 11, show the hate-filled heart of Judas Iscariot toward Jesus. So you might think of it also not just a sandwich, but like bookends. And between those bookends, between those pieces of bread, uh, are verses 3 through 9. And verses 3 through 9, I'll call the meat of the sandwich, which we're going to see a genuine love and worship toward Jesus. You've got hatred on both sides, and you've got love in the middle. Look at Mark chapter 14, verse 1. It says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly. Can you say secretly with me? They were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Why were the people wanting to kill Jesus? They were upset because he was exposing their hypocrisy. They claimed to be godly religious men, and Jesus was proving them to be really religious phonies. Jesus was a threat to their religious system. And if you don't know already, their religious system wasn't about God. It was all about them. And they wanted to do this secretly. Have you ever noticed, even in your own life today, that hatred moves behind the scenes? If you're going to be attacked nine times out of ten, it's going to be behind your back. Amen? It's in those silent whispers, in those things that are said in private, not out in the open. Well, it's been the same way, so don't feel bad, even since the days of Jesus. These men are scheming not only to arrest Jesus, but they want to have him killed. They want to put him to death. How much hate does a person have to have to kill someone? Maybe that's too nice of a way to put it. How much hate does a person have to have to murder someone, especially someone who's never done anything wrong ever? The only thing Jesus ever did was love people. The only thing he ever did. So when I hear this story and see the first slice of bread and the second slice of bread and all that hatred, it's shocking to me. But I would say this is human nature at its worst, right? Wouldn't you say that? Human nature at its worst. But the next thing we're going to look at, we're going to see a picture of human nature at its best. We're actually going to start out, on one hand, seeing a deep hatred of Jesus from his enemies. On the other hand, we're going to see an unconditional love from one of his followers. And just for the record, this story is really a flashback. It's not happening in the moment. Uh, it happened a few days earlier. So it's being remembered here. And look at verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. Let me stop there. You could easily put two letters in front of that word leper. You could put the letter E and the letter X. Of course, that's going to say X leper because this is Simon the X leper. And note where he's at. He's in a house, probably having a meal with people. If you're a leper, you're not going to be in a house filled with people. If you're a leper, they're going to put you out on the streets. You're going to be cast out and probably to a leper colony. So this is one of the people that Jesus has healed, one of them that he's cured. This is Simon, the ex-leper, who was healed by Jesus. So it says, as Jesus sat reclining at the table, it says a woman. Let me point out who this woman is. Her name is Mary. It's not Mary Magdalene that we read about in the Bible. It's not Mary, the mother of Jesus. In John chapter 12, John actually identifies her as Mary of Bethany. And if you remember, Mary of Bethany is the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus. And they were all very good friends with Jesus. But it says, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. So picture this, as those men were talking, Martha, the other sister, was busy in the kitchen. She's busy serving, making sure everything is perfect. 
Mary, Mary quietly slips out of the room, and she returns with something precious and very expensive in her hands. Mark calls it an alabaster jar filled with perfume. Let me just say this. This isn't perfume that she got on clearance at Dollar General or Dollar Tree, not at all. This isn't a six-pack of Old Spice, as good as we men think that is. That's not it. Mark calls it spikenard. This is an imported perfume from India used by kings, and it was very expensive. Scripture said it's worth about 300 denarii. Well, I Googled it. I'm lying. Cheryl Googled it for me because I don't know how to Google. And in today's world, uh, it comes to about $45,000. Just to tell you how expensive this perfume would have been, which is really when you think about the median amount of salary for a year's wages in, in the U U.S. today. So I'm just pointing that out just to let you know how expensive this perfume was. Some scholars believe that it could have been a costly family heirloom that she was bringing. And if so, it was not only costly and expensive, it had a lot of sentimental value to Mary. But because I know the rest of the story, I'm thinking, she's thinking, you know, it doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter the value. I just want to show my Jesus as much love as I can. And I'm willing to give him whatever is the most precious to me. One thing that stood out to me, too, is she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. I love this, really. Why do you think she would break that bottle and pour it on Jesus? I've got three thoughts if you're taking notes. I believe she breaks that bottle of not only perfume but expensive perfume to, number one, show her commitment to Jesus. She's showing a real commitment to Jesus. It's like she's saying, Jesus, I'm going all in here. I'm not going to uh, hold part of this back for me. She says, I'm going to show you, Jesus, how much I truly love you by giving you everything I've got. I'm not going to give you part of what I have. I'm going to give you the best of all that I have. Yeah, it's very expensive. It costs a year's worth of labor, but nothing but the best for my Lord. I give it all to you, Jesus. She says, I'm not going to hold anything back. You know what kind of a commitment that is? That's unconditional. And that's a total, complete commitment. Number two. She's showing how much she values him. I believe when she broke that jar and poured out its contents, she was telling Jesus loud and clear, you mean more to me than anything else in this world. Nothing was as valuable to this woman as Jesus. She loved him not with a love, just a love. She loved him with an extravagant love. And I believe she knew deep down in her heart everything she had anyway belonged to him. She loved her Lord more than she loved her things. I think we need to hear that sometimes. She loved her Lord more than she loved her comforts, more than she loved her privileges, more than she loved everything that she had. And number three, she believed the prophecies that were spoken about Jesus and how he needed to be worshipped. He needed to be worshipped. Remember what Jesus said to his own disciples at the Last Supper? He said, this is my body, broken for you. Think about it. The most valuable, precious, expensive commodity in the universe the blood and the body of Jesus Christ is about to be broken for us, about to be poured out for us, not only for us, but on us. Think about it. Jesus didn't withhold any of himself from us. He gave it all. Some scholars believe that Mary's sacrifice for Jesus could very well be a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice for us. You know what sacrifice is? Sacrifice is giving up something you love for something you love more. And I'm sure as much as Mary probably loved that perfume, I don't think she regretted it one bit because she loved Jesus even more. Because in this moment, Mary is openly, unashamedly worshiping Jesus, and Mary refused to keep her worship of Jesus to herself. She refused to keep it to herself or in private. She lavished her worship on him in front of everyone to see. John tells us that the house is full of guests when this all takes place. So this is not a private act of affection at all. This is a public display of worship. A public display of her worship and her adoration toward Jesus. How many dog people do I have in the house? Anybody love your dogs? Uh, I'm going to leave cats out for today. How many love your dogs? Well, if you've ever seen my wife driving around, going on errands, or maybe coming down here to the church, you've probably seen our dog before. Because her big, flat, white, fluffy head's hanging out the window and her tongue's blowing in the breeze. She loves to ride with Cheryl. She comes down here to church with Cheryl. She's a lot of company for Cheryl. We call her a church dog for sure. 
But anytime Cheryl leaves the house and doesn't take Gemma with her, you know what she does right off the bat? She'll go into Austin's room, which is in the front of the house, so where, where she can have a bird's eye view of that driveway. She kn- so she knows the second Cheryl pulls back up. And if I happen to take Gemma out before Cheryl's back and Cheryl pulls in the drive, Gemma makes a beeline as fast as she can running right toward the car like she's going to run into it. And I swear she's grinning from ear to ear, I just think. Or when Cheryl doesn't take her and she sees Cheryl pull up, she knows the sound of Cheryl's car when it pulls into the car uh, different than Austin or my car. And she'll sit in front of that door there in the utility room that comes in from the garage and she just is looking up. Her tail is wagging, and she's waiting for Cheryl to open that door. And as soon as Cheryl opens that door, oh, boy, it's on. I mean, she's jumping up on Cheryl. She's hugging and loving on Cheryl. Cheryl's doing the same to her. Austin and I could be right there, and Jimma doesn't even know we're in the room. Jim acts like uh, Cheryl's been gone for five years, and she's been gone for 20 minutes. It's crazy. But trust me, Jimma doesn't care who's watching. She doesn't care if our barn cat's sitting there watching her and uh, thinking bad of her. She didn't care about that. No, she's bound and determined to show Cheryl as much love and affection as she possibly can. You know, in a sense, that dog in her own way and in her own mind is actually worshiping her. So when I think about Mary in this whole story, Mary didn't care who saw her worshiping her Lord. She didn't care because she wasn't worried about those that would be watching. She was worried and focused on him, her Savior. Yeah, it may have looked silly to everyone else, may not have made any sense, but she was willing to look like a fool to worship Jesus. How many times are we willing to look like a fool to worship Jesus? I remember years ago, my Aunt Kate, my dad's sister, she came up from Mount Vernon. It was early in my ministry. She wanted to hear me preach. And I remember I preached the sermon, and I gave an altar call, and my Aunt Kate come to the front. And I started praying over my Aunt Kate, And all of a sudden, the Lord got a hold of her. And all of a sudden, she started crying. She started shouting. And she started getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And pretty soon, me being the spiritual man I am, I'm thinking, wow, what's everybody going to think? And I'm really trying to say, Aunt Kate, you need to hush a little bit. You know what God did with me in that moment? He rebuked me right then and there in my heart, because she was worshiping him with her whole heart. And what people didn't know about my Aunt Kate was a few years before that, her son, uh, my cousin, was a terrible alcoholic. And she was always bailing him out of jail. He was always being thrown in jail. And one night, the police station called and said, we've got your son again, do you want to bail him out? And she said, no, I think I'm going to practice some tough love tonight. Uh, You watch him for the night, I'll come and get him in the morning. Well, that night, my cousin hung himself in the jail. He killed himself. My Aunt Kate had a nervous breakdown. She was tormented with the thought and blamed herself because she thought if I'd have just gone and got him, he wouldn't be dead. But that morning in prayer, God showed up. That morning in prayer, God knew exactly what my Aunt Kate needed. She needed set free from all the guilt from all the torment that she had struggled with for years and years and years. And in that moment, God touched her heart. God touched her life. God set her free. And she didn't care who was watching. She was worshiping Almighty God because He was her answer. He was her solution. He was her peace in that moment. God stirred her spirit that day, and He set her free. From that day forward, she was different. God set her free. That's a perfect story of the power of worship in our lives. When we're willing to go out on a limb and say, I don't care what people think of me. I don't care how ridiculous I look. I'm going to meet up with Jesus today, and I'm going to worship him with my whole heart. If we can worship him with our whole heart, who knows what can happen. Amen? I guarantee he'll set you free because worship is actually giving and showing a huge amount of love, not just a little bit, a huge amount of love, loyalty, and respect for our God. You know what it really is? It's flinging ourselves humbly but excitedly into the presence of God. I don't know about you, but I can see King David doing that all through the book of Psalms. He's known for his worship of God. Psalms 42, verse 1. Everybody probably has this scripture memorized. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. David went through some really hard times. And he's just putting it in perspective. We don't know how long this deer hasn't had a drink of water, But I can imagine this deer is like it's been out in the desert, 
And he says, so the, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longs after you. Do you know what worship does? It combines our desperation for Jesus and our sincere appreciation for him and what he's done in our lives. So why would Mary worship Jesus like this? I'll tell you why. Because she knew without a doubt he was worthy. She did it because she was thankful. She knew that Jesus was her redeemer. And not only that, she also knew that he had physically raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. That would do something to you. Amen? So she was overwhelmed with so much love for him that she was willing to give him her all, everything she had, in one act of selfless, extravagant worship. On top of all that, she believes in something the disciples were actually struggling with. Mary believed that Jesus was soon to go to the cross and die. So as far as she knew, in her own mind, I believe she's thinking, this could be my last opportunity to actually serve him, to honor him, to lavish him with, with my love and my appreciation, with my worship. So she seized that opportunity, and she made it count for the glory of God. But then look what happens in the story. Before the last drop of perfume hits the floor, She's bombarded with criticism. Look at verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. When you first hear that, you might think, well, it kind of makes sense. God definitely wants us to help the poor. The only problem here is that wasn't their intent. Their whole thing was a cover-up because they really didn't want to see her use that expensive perfume on Jesus or for Jesus. And guess who John, in the book of John, chapter 12, tells us instigated the whole thing? None other than Judas Iscariot, one of his inner circle. I'll call him the old fault finder. I'll call him the old sin sniffer. How many know anybody like that? They're always looking to find fault with somebody. They're always looking to criticize somebody for something. You walk, they walk in the room and it's sniff, sniff, sniff. I smell this, I smell that, and you've done this wrong, and they're just trying to be critical. Well, Judas was trying to do that with Mary. Judas was also the treasurer of the bunch, if you don't know that, of the 12 disciples. And John also explains the real reason why Judas objected to it. John chapter 12, verse 6, listen to what John says. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, or the treasurer, he used him... He used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas didn't really care about the poor. He wanted to keep more for himself. But look what Jesus did. He praises Mary, but he also came to her defense. Look at verse 6. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. Just so you don't take this wrong, Jesus is not telling us not to help the poor. We should help the poor and needy every chance we're uh, able to. And so you don't take this wrong. Everything Jesus ever said or did was actually backed up by Scripture. He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 15 here. Deuteronomy chapter 15 says, the, for, the poor will never cease from the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Therefore, open your hand toward the brother and toward the poor and toward the needy. So he's saying you need to help them. In other words, you'll always have the opportunity to be generous toward the poor, but right now, Mary's doing something different. Mary's taking this moment, this opportunity to draw close to Jesus. And Jesus says simply that Mary seized that moment. She had that window of opportunity, and she took it. And she didn't care what anybody thought about it. Uh, look what Jesus goes on to say, but you will not always have me. He's saying, you're going to have your poor with you always but you're not always going to have me. He says, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Over and over again, Jesus has been informing the people that he's heading toward death. Not one of them really believed him. The only one that believed him was this Mary of Bethany. She believed that that was the whole purpose why he came in the beginning was to die. She understood that he was heading toward his burial. But look at verse 9. What Jesus says about Mary and what she has just done. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, and it's being preached this morning, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Here we are 2,000 years later, thousands of miles away from where it originally happened. Here we are in a whole other culture, another language, honoring this woman who gave, all because her story is told in the gospel. 
Now I want you to look at the contrast of Mary's love to the hatred of Judas. Look at verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but any time the list of disciples is given, Judas' name is always last on that list because of his betrayal. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest who betrayed Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Think about the relationship between Jesus and Judas. They could have been basically best friends. He was in his inner circle of guys. In his inner circle. This guy sold him out. He betrayed him. Colluded with the religious leaders to have him put to death. I think this is so important for us to catch today because this means that proximity to Jesus does not guarantee faithfulness to Jesus. You get that? You can be close to him physically, but not spiritually. Being around God and the things of God doesn't mean you really love God. You know, I think that's the reason why a lot of the world thinks that the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, Some of the meanest and nastiest people who go to church, attend Bible studies, sing in the choir, have that honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker on their car. They could be some of the biggest vipers out there. You know what I mean, and don't you be pointing this morning. You know what I'm saying. What I'm really saying is you can be connected with Jesus, but not really be connected to Jesus. The reason Judas could do all the evil, wicked things he did was because he wasn't connected to Jesus. He knew about him, but he didn't know him. I believe when it comes down to it, for Judas, for all of us, it's all a condition of your heart. And Judas loved money more than, he did, more than he did Jesus. So he sold out the Son of God for a few coins, 30 pieces of silver. You know, it's ironic that a trader loses everything but gains treasure. But a woman gains everything by losing her treasure. Did you get that? She lost her treasure. One lost by gaining, another gained by losing. In this story, I want to point out something else that Jesus said about Mary. If you go back to verse 8 again, I want to focus on these five words. She did what she could. She did what she could. This is something that every one of us in this room can relate to today because every one of us can do something to further the kingdom of God. You realize that? Every one of us can do something. God's not calling you to do everything. Don't think you have to do everything because He's not. But we need to take whatever we've been given and do what we can with it. Amen? You can't evangelize the whole world, neither can I. But we can tell one person at a time about Jesus. You can't feed every starving soul, but you can feed some. You can't help everybody through every need they have, but you can help some. I can't preach everywhere, but I can walk, surely walk through the open doors that God provides for me to walk through. Uh, I can't give everything that this church needs, but I can give my tithes and my offerings to support this uh, work here. I can use my time and my talents to uh, repair the buildings, uh, do things like that, or volunteer for some outreach program. Maybe it's setting things up. Maybe it's tearing them down, volunteering for some other position. What I'm saying is all of us can do something. Every one of us can do something because that's all God asks of us. We make it too hard sometimes. You think you've got to have a pastor position or something before you can do anything. All God asks us to do is do what you can. You can't do it all. I can't do it all. But there are some things that he tells us to do. Number one is prayer. We need to be praying. We need to be good witnesses for him everywhere we go. We need to work for his kingdom. We need to give. We need to be faithful. We need to read our Bible, support the church. Uh, We need to visit those that need visited to help those that need helped. We need to take our uh, lonely neighbor out to lunch, maybe just to be a listening ear, maybe volunteer to teach in a Sunday school class. Do what you can. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. He's talking about the gifts that God has given us. And God's given every one of us gifts. Some more than others, but he's given every one of us gifts. Having gifts that differ, he says, according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Paul's saying you've all been given uh, gifts. Don't just keep them for yourself. Actually use them for the kingdom of God. We can't do everything and we're all not going to do the same thing. Amen? All he's calling us to do is do what we can. The problem I hear about from many pastors is that too many of us are content with doing as little as we possibly can we all love to go to church that have these amazing programs already in place so we can be ministered to or our children can be ministered to but it's a whole other thing uh, to volunteer to help grow those programs do you realize that 
there's something that we can do to help. In one of the Apollo projects, someone looked inside the capsule and asked the astronauts getting ready to take off, well, how does it feel? With a grin, one of them replied, it really makes you think twice here. When you realize everything in this whole project was constructed according to the lowest bid. <laughs> if you're getting ready to head to the moon or wherever, yeah, that would be a sobering thought. The thing is, that's the way a lot of people live their lives, according to the lowest bid. And sadly, that's the way we love our Lord sometimes. We try to barely skimp by. So when it comes to our worship, let me just challenge you. Don't go for the lowest bid. Don't go for the thing that's going to cost you the least. Instead, go way beyond the ordinary when it comes to loving Jesus. When it comes to serving Jesus, love Him with all of your heart. Love Him to the point where everyone around you says, well, that's ridiculous. That's a waste. For if we love the Lord, truly love the Lord, guess what? We're going to love Him like Mary loved Him, with an extravagant type of love. Mary didn't do more than she could. She simply did all that she could. Amen? She did all that she could. She wasn't by, bo bothered by what she couldn't do. She focused on what she could do. So my question to every one of us today, are you doing all you can do for the kingdom of God? Are you doing all you can do to get in an attitude of worship for God? The last thing I want to say is from verse 8 again, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I've heard things like this said at funerals. Some people say, well, uh, some people never get flowers until they die, and then all the flowers show up. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, she's giving me the bouquet before the funeral. Back then, when you prepared a body for burial, you would anoint it with perfumed oil. Mary understood that Jesus came to this earth. His whole mission was to die. John said that when Mary anointed Jesus, the house was filled with fragrance. I can picture this. If you know the story, Mary wiped the feet of Jesus with her hair. When Mary wiped the feet of Jesus with her hair, that fragrance that was on Jesus now was on her. The things she had poured out on Jesus came back to bless her. Think about this. For the rest of the night, for the next day, and who knows how many days ahead. Wherever Mary went, she carried that fragrance of worship with her. And I'm sure that when people walk by Mary, they probably, wow. That smells lovely. And she would have been reminded of being in the presence of Jesus. Do you know that you can usually tell when you're around somebody that has poured themselves out to Jesus? You can just tell it. Because there's a spiritual fragrance all around them. And it's not because you got on Facebook and told people how spiritual you are. How many Bible studies you've gone to. How many times you attended church last month. Because if you've done that, the Bible says you already got your reward. Amen. But the Bible does, says, what, does say whatever is done in secret is revealed from the housetops. We can't hide anything from God. Amen. He sees our hearts. He sees our attitudes this morning. But when it comes to worship, when you're sacrificing your time, your energy, your efforts, just to get along with God, to sit in His presence, when you're busy worshiping Him, listening to Him, let me tell you, His presence is going to be all over you. People may not see it, but I'm telling you, they're going to sense it because God's presence is filling you. It's emanating from you. It's coming out from you, and it's touching lives all around you because it's tangible. When you get that close to God, when you get that close to Jesus, that fragrance like Mary came upon her, it's going to come upon you. When's the last time you got alone with God? When was the last time? I have to ask myself that all the time. A lot of times I'm thinking, wow, I can't even remember. When was the last time you got alone with God and got on your face before Him and you poured yourself out? You know, I need Him. You need Him. And He's waiting for us to give Him the worship that only He deserves. Amen? Remember what you give to Jesus is going to come back to bless you. Jesus said, as long as the gospel is preached, what this woman has done will be remembered. Think about it. Mary broke that alabaster jar over 2,000 years ago. Yet today, people are still smelling the fragrance of that worship. I'm challenging everyone in this room today. Let your life be a sacrifice to God. Let that time spent with God put a fragrance on you that this world hungers for. They might not realize that that's what they need. 
until they're around a follower of Christ who's given the time to pray, to seek God, to say, God, I want your presence to be all over me. Not so I can say, who, look who I am, because that doesn't matter. But look who my Jesus is. Look at the love that he has for everyone around me. So many times we go through life passing people by, not even thinking twice about their spiritual life, not even thinking twice about their eternity, because we're too busy. We're too focused on me. We're too focused on us. God says, spend enough time in my presence that my fragrance will fill every room you go into. Amen. I want that for my life. But, you know, it comes by being intentional about your worship. We can't just, it's not automatic. We have to be intentional about our worship. Or else it's not going to happen. The things that God wants to happen is not going to happen. If I didn't spend a little bit of time in prayer during the week, I guarantee you this message, and I'm sure it still does sometimes, would, be, would fall flat on its face. But because of God's presence, and I'm giving him all the glory today, because of God's presence, it's going into every heart, every mind, every life. Because he is the hope, the God of hope that has hope for every one of us. So today, I encourage you to be like Mary, to not care what people think about your time spent with worshiping Him, and first of all, make time to worship Him, and then let God do the rest. Amen? Could you stand to your feet this morning? If you need prayer for anything, I know I covered uh, prayer uh, needs with a blanket prayer earlier. If you need prayer for anything, I encourage you to come down front. Pam and I will be down front to pray for you. But I believe God is in the house. And I said at the very beginning this, worship, worship is my favorite thing. Because my life has and was broken, broken, broken. But there was always something in my heart. And, and I thank my grandpa for that. I thank my dad for that. My mom for that, for instilling faith in an almighty God. That when you'll take the time to worship him, he's already there before you get there. But when you show up, he's already there, waiting, ready to do what you need in your life. So this morning, whatever you might need in your life, I preached on worship, my favorite topic. Mary showed us a, the most beautiful picture of worship you could ever see. Yeah, we saw the ugly, ugliness before and after, but we saw, saw the most beautiful picture of how we could worship Jesus and how we should worship Jesus. So this morning, if you just need encouragement to say, hey, I need to worship Jesus more, I want to draw closer, come on up for prayer. As I'm closing in prayer, I invite you to come. Could you all bow your hearts in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray you'd give us a heart of a true worshiper today, every one of us. Give us the heart of Mary today that didn't care who was watching. She didn't care what people would think. She poured herself out to you, and she loved you with everything she had. She didn't hold anything back. She did what she could do. She gave what she could give. Lord, may we all do the same for you today, for your glory, for your praise, for your honor today and forever. You and you alone deserve our worship. We love you. We praise you. I thank you for the miracles that have taken place today. And I thank you for the miracles that are walking out of here today with the fragrance of Jesus Christ surrounding them to make a difference in this world. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.